Well, good morning, Gateway. Glad to be back here this morning. If you're visiting, we don't want this first time here to be your last time, so please fill out one of those connection cards and seat backs in front of you. Let us know of your visit here. Grab one of those great coffee mugs out there with some chocolates in it. And uh, no, I don't want to add this to the 12th cup at your home, so make sure that you're a first-time visitor. So grateful to be back. Can you believe it? A, a week ago, I was sitting in a hospital bed watching you, all you online, and Ryan did a great job, by the way. Amen. A great job, yeah. I told him that we should probably give him 36 hours notice more often. It was so good. We're so grateful for that. For those of you who don't know, I had an emergency appendectomy on Saturday morning, actually about noon, and uh, God has been healing me ever since. It's been amazing. I can tell you this, um, I don't like hospitals. I don't know a lot of people do. I don't mind visiting you in the hospital, but when I'm in the hospital, I have fear of hospitals. And uh, I got to meet a lot of great people. By the way, God bless you if you work in the healthcare field, because when we need you, you're there. So thank you. Thank you to my doctor, Dr. Rosa. Thank you, Lord, for Annabelle, who took care of me, and many of the other nurses and the anesthesiologists who all told me a little bit of their stories. And I'm a preacher, so everything in that whole orientation with them, that conversation, becomes a sermon illustration. I have free reign on all of that. But, uh, you know, I know this this morning. While there was a spiritual thing going on in some ways for me, God really showing me that he's in control and he can do anything he desires to do, even in sickness. It's just an encouragement to you. And some of you come this morning and you're in the hurt locker right now. You're suffering in your life. And God wants to bring you to a place where he can do a little spiritual surgery on you. And it's my prayer that you will surrender yourself to his knife so that he could take out the cancer within to heal you completely. Sometimes that's what the doctor has to do. How do I know that? It kind of happened. So uh, they did some kind of, uh, they gave me some pictures. And I wanted to show you some of these pictures. Now, they're kind of graphic before we show them. So they gave me pictures. And I was told when I was a young pastor that I should always relate to my congregation right? So that I'd be vulnerable and open with you. And you've heard me say to, to before that intimacy was into me, you see. So you get a real inward look of what's inside me here, right here. Do you see that? Now, do you notice that little speck? They were looking around for stuff. What's causing all this? What's happening inside of Ron's, Ron's you know, innards? Let me show you what was going on here. Go ahead. That's what was going on. <laughs> I love you, Dan Bowman. I love you. Yeah. You know, true brothers uh, could never joke around like this. I mean, and, and, and those who are necessarily enemies, but we are really true brothers, and I know he takes that with grace. Uh, Dan, Ryan, Pastor Dave, the rest of the staff, thank you for stepping up uh, when I had to step out. And we're grateful for it. We have a great staff, don't we? Amen. Appreciate it, brother. That. Yeah. Well, as we... Uh, as we go into uh, this next part of Gideon, you know, Ryan talked about the spoiler alert last week, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about the prequel, the prequel to Gideon, the story that you heard last week. So we're going backwards a bit to Judges 6. J Ryan did Judges 7. Uh, but as I was in the hospital, I had some time, and I started thinking about all the fears, my fear of hospitals. There's a name for that. I'll probably get it wrong. Nosocomophobia. That's fear of hospitals. Some of you know what arachnophobia is, the fear of spiders, right? Uh, glossophobia, the fear of public speaking. It's interesting in my research that more people fear public speaking than death itself. Interesting. Uh, then they have windbagophobia, <laughs> which is the fear of long sermons, right? <laughs> That's not really a fear. I just made that up. Okay. <laughs> Olfactophobia, the fear of foul smells. This is why we put Dan Bowman right by the men's restroom, his office. <laughs> Yeah, nomophobia, this is probably a lot of us here this morning, the fear of being without your phone. Some of you reached for it just now, as I said that. So fear comes to us in all kinds, all parts of our life. And your success as a believer in Christ is determined on how you manage those kinds of fears that come at you, those anxieties. Today we're going to look at courage and Gideon when it comes to being a very, uh, well, you could say, a uh, scared, nervous bird uh, to a courageous guy that God would use. As a kid, I was a nervous wreck. I used to walk around in high school especially. I don't know why, but sweaty palms, nervous all the time. My gut just wrenching all around and, and just really nervous. It reminds me of a story 
of a guy who was, who was uh, having the same kinds of problems. He had to go to his boss to confront him about something at work. And every time he thought about that confrontation, his stomach would churn, his palms would get sweaty, his mouth would just dry up like cotton. It happened just thinking about it in the middle of the night. Finally, he told his, his wife, what do I do about this? He's like, every time I think about this, my palms get sweaty, I get really nervous, my stomach starts churning, and my mouth gets dry as cotton. It's just crazy. She said, well, that's easy, honey. Just lick your palms. Lick your palms. You, you know, our wives are great at giving us solutions. By the way, I'm so grateful for my wife, who's been my number one nurse and, and got me back to health. It's so cra- crazy. But the fears for all of us can do crazy things to us, not just internally, but externally. Do you have a fear? A fear about some medical news that you've had or gotten? Do you have fear about your marriage and where it's headed or where your family will be in five years? Uh, Or a fear that you'll never find that right person in your life? Well, today we're going to see in this passage a guy who was really kind of cowardly become really courageous. Uh, Before we do that, we teach the word of God here. We teach the Bible. We do the best that we can to reflect back what the Bible says. Uh, is telling us. We believe that the Bible is per- perfect. It has no errors in it. it. It's really the only perfect thing on earth that we have. And we believe that if you want a word from God, you have to go to the word of God to get a word from him. But I know this. Not everyone in this room, outside in the courtyard, online listening, believes the same thing. Some people believe that they can judge the word of God. And if the Bible says that, I don't believe the Bible says that. And others think that we need to make the Bible really super relevant because we live so many years removed from the Bible. The Bible, listen, is relevant. In fact, I don't have to make it relevant to you. I hope that you will see it today, um, that it is relevant to our life today. If you think about what's happening in Israel, some of you have been here for this series already. What's happening in Israel isn't much different than what's happening in our culture today. Uh, Studying this book... Oftentimes, when you open the Bible, it will offend you. The Bible is an equal opportunity offender for everyone in every generation. If it's not offending you as a believer, especially, like, wow, that's like talking about my life, and now that kind of hurts, you probably aren't reading it correctly. So we should always come back to the Bible for truth. I know this. So I'll say something, and you won't necessarily agree, but what does the Bible say about that? Go back to God's word. What's fascinating in the day of the judges, that country was around, and the nation around 300 years old. Our nation is around 250, 250 years old. And we see these kinds of cycles coming along in their development as a nation. And we could take our development as a nation and kind of superimpose what's happening in America. There are a few things happening that we should know. Number one, uh, a common theme for the people especially in Judges uh, 1721. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. This is our culture today. Everyone doing right what is in their own eyes. There's no authority. There's no God's authority. There's no governmental authority. There's no rule of law that people will come under. There's no spiritual authority. No one has authority over you. And so oftentimes this is happening in Israel. It's happening even in us today. We also see that... uh, As the generations matured, this is really important and great to see Mandy and Jake dedicate their child. But you know that child has to make a decision at some point who they're going to serve. What God are they going to serve? The God of self, the God of the culture, or the God of the Bible? And I know some people don't believe this, but one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. You don't have to believe that. God's not going to force that on you, but one day you will believe it because you'll see it with your own eyes. That's what the Bible tells us. So the, the number two thing that I want to point out is the result that every generation kind of gets worse. And we'll see that it's a downward spiral with all of these generations getting worse and even their leaders not doing such a great job in leading. The judges would be used for two things, really. Reformation in the church and revival in the culture. God's people are supposed to bring God's word to the world. When God's people no longer bring God's word to the world, what happens? The world loses hope. Hope. Hope in the name of Jesus. And this is our job as believers. So before we can have any change in culture or the world around us, we have to have change in the church, folks. We have to have change in our lives individually. 
And that's what hopefully we're praying for during this series, that God would get a hold of your heart, that it would reach down deep into the recesses of your heart where you've pushed him away and rejected him, you would begin to turn around and accept and open your arms to him and hands to him and say, work in me. Well, let's look at this uh, person, Gideon, in uh, Judges 6, verse 1. Everybody looking at a Bible? Even if it's on your phone, I don't mind the little glow on your face. That's fine. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Say that with me. Did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Here they are again. And for seven years, they gave them into the hands of the Midianites. These were Canaanites, a group of Canaanites. We're going to see today, again, this cycle in Judges. Put it up there on the screen for you. This whole cycle, Israel rebels, God punishes, Israel cries out, God has mercy, sends a judge, judge delivers, Israel has peace. Kind of what we do. We get comfortable, we're surrendered at first, but we get comfortable, we get, what, self, self-reliant, and eventually that self-reliance comes into some kind of self-inflicted wound, and we try to bail ourselves out, but ultimately we get to the bottom of the barrel and we look up and say God helps us and he delivers us, and then we get comfortable again. And the cycle starts over. That's what can happen to us. Ultimately, when we read this scripture in this passage, I want you to see that there's a theme in Judges, that God relentlessly pursues his rebellious people. God relentlessly pursues his rebellious people. Turn to the person next to you and say, that's good news for you. That's really good news for you. Okay. They are stuck in this cycle. Again, stuck in the... God loves his kids. Did you know that? He knows this, that everyone is flawed, everyone is odd, O-D-D, but not God. And so he's bringing us back, and this is what he wants to do. He wants to restore you and rescue you. But the result of this cycle is that they're doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 2, because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. They became preppers, right? They went up to the mountains. And they they were living off grid. This is what happened to them. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. Interesting. No borders. This is what happens. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza. There's a war there today. And did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep or cattle or donkeys. They They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them. How many were there? We couldn't count. There's too many. Or their camels. They invaded the land and they ravaged it. This was like middle school boys at a pizza party. One time through and all the pizza's gone, right? Or it could be for you like uh, the IRS. There's nothing left when you're all done. You know what I'm saying? For verse 6, Midian was so impoverished that the Israelites, that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent a, look at the, look at the screen. What's it say? A prophet. He sent a prophet. That's actually not what they were wanting, was it? A prophet? So I want to show you how God turns terror into triumph, how he can take your cowardliness and turn it into courage. Notice the cry for a deliverer, but what does God ultimately give? He sends them a sermon. He sends them a prophet to give a sermon. They weren't asking for a teaching. They were asking for a deliverance. This would be like you getting stuck on 17. You call AAA, and AAA sends you a pamphlet. Okay, Israel's problem was primarily not the Midianites. Israel's problem was their, themselves. They asked for deliverance from God, and God says what you need first is a heart change. And that comes from the word of God, giving a sermon. So God sends a sermon before he sends a savior. By the way, I know last week Pastor Ryan said, whoever could fill in these notes could get a prize from me. Uh, It was Amber Harrell, uh, Amber Britt, who actually filled them out like five minutes within Ryan saying that because you can go on the Bible app and see all my answers there. Anyway, (laughs) she got my my pork pork slider from last week. Uh, Some of you are in the same position today. You ask God for something, but he's not giving you what you've asked for. You're seeking God for what you want, but God is in turn putting the spotlight right onto your heart But I want to say this, sometimes suffering God will use for sure. Not every suffering comes as a response of disobedience. Some of it comes as a result, yes, of your consequences, of your actions. But I know strong believers who suffer as much as, if not more, than non-believers. 
You're saying, Pastor Ron, I came to get good news today. That's not good news for me as a believer. Listen to what Psalm 119.67 says. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I obey your word. This is what happens in affliction. I can tell you that at 9-11, this church, I've never seen a prayer meeting such as after 9-11 in this church. Our building was full of people seeking God. It came because some kind of crisis and affliction. This God will use it. Is it possible that God is trying to get your attention today? You came wanting to God to give you help for the situation you're in, bail you out, if you will, give you a raise, give, a, give you a solution for the problem that you have. But God is saying to you, what I need you to do in your heart, I need to do in your heart, is way more important than the thing you're asking for. Look at verse 8. He sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Verse 9, I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. He, what's he doing? He's reminding them of himself, which also means he's reminding them of who they are. If I am the Lord your God, you are my children. And this is where we start with identity. This is why there's such an attack on identity in many different ways in our culture. The enemy wants to get at who you are. And again, sometimes we think about activity before identity. But look what it says. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. This is the activity you do once you understand who you are in Christ. What was happening with the Israelites, listen, it happens to us today. It's called synchronism. Synchronism is when you take a little bit of God and a little bit of what's happening in the culture or another religion and you blend them together and you say, this is my religion. And that was what was so offensive to God for the Israelites. He wanted them to be his people, separate, set apart. The word is holy. This is uh, what happens when the regular teaching of God's word goes out. What happens in the heart of the believer? Listen, I know I'm not that good, but I know that the Holy Spirit is awesome. I know this, that if I can at least be able to speak the word to you in a clear way, and sometimes I mess that up, I know that the Holy Spirit will work in you like I can never work in you. And he's been doing it in many of you. Every day this week in the evening, we've come together to pray for God to do a work within our church and the culture. It's amazing to see what God is doing in our church. And perhaps you're here today, you say, well, I don't know, I, this hardship is too hard for me, it's too difficult, I can't do it. Listen, oftentimes God will use hardship to bring you back. That's a principle I want you to see. Some of you think that God's using hardship to pay you back, but he's actually using hardship to bring you back to him. You may have come this morning, why is this happening to me? Listen, maybe he's trying to get your attention. Pay attention to the tension. Whatever tension you're feeling there, pay attention to, you, to that. God is not trying to pay you back. He's trying to get you back and bring you back. Now, notice how the people, they didn't respond to the sermon right away, like many of you. Didn't respond to the sermon right away, right? Um, but before there's any response of repentance or sorrow, God is already moving. This is what I mean. You came into this church. God already planted seeds in you. Somebody has been witnessing to you. Somebody's been telling you about God's goodness. You don't necessarily believe it. But when you came in this room and we started singing songs of praise to our almighty God, something in you was stirred and you cannot explain it. That's the transcendent work of the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you came in this room. You might even felt condemned. That's not from God. That's Satan punch him in the throat. If that condemnation you feel is actually conviction from the Holy Spirit, that's something different we'll talk about. Pay attention to that. So again, God here is helping us see that he's on the move before we ever repent. He's moving. Even when I can't feel it, he's working. You know that song? Never stop. He's never stopped working. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak tree in Ophrah. Or is it Oprah, and said, look under your seat. No, just kidding. I said, that belonged to Joash, the Abyssalite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Wine press, horrible place, by the way. I don't know much about threshing wheat, but I know this. You need wind. Toss it up in the air. You need some air to separate the chaff, right, from the grain. And so here, here Gideon is in a wine press. There's a hole down in the ground tossing it way high to get it up there so that he wouldn't be seen. He's scared. He's afraid. Verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said, say it with me, 
The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. How many people, you never say those things ever when I ask. Just raise your hand, right? I was just kidding. I almost got you to raise your hand. Dang it. So it'd be like saying to a 4 foot 11, 125 pound guy, wow, hey, big fella, how's it going? It seems ironic here, but this is what's happening. The angel is not mocking Gideon. This is the core point of the message of Gideon. God doesn't speak to Gideon based on who he is, but based on what God is going to make him into. That's really good news for you. Gideon is not called because he's courageous. Ryan mentioned this before about being equipped, but he's made courageous because he's called. God gives courage to the called. You need to hear that. Somebody here who's, who you are freaked out with anxiety, God gives courage to the called. He doesn't wait for you to have courage to call you. He calls you, then he gives you what you need. You see, when God calls you, he doesn't just see or define you by who you are right now, the condition that which you're in. Look, you're a mess. You came into this place a mess. How do I know? Because that's me too. But he has determined to make you into Christ, into what Christ wants for you to make you brand new. That's what the cross is all about. That's where our power comes from. That's what the resurrection is all about, God doing new things in you. All right, this is really good news for all of us here. He doesn't reward the righteous and the courageous. He actually makes the righteous and courageous, righteous, courageous. That's what he does. He's not necessarily waiting to reward you. So if you're freaked out, good. So am I. But let's walk forward in trusting God, in faith, and he will give us the courage that we need. Look at what, he's in the hole, he's in the ground. This is irony to me. In a, in a hole in the ground, he's like, okay, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And look what he says, verse 13. Pardon me, he's really polite. He's polite to the angel. Pardon me, my Lord Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? You ever asked that? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Some of you know this because you're psychologists or counselors. This is Gideon's explanatory style, how he explains the events that happened to him. I want you to note it's incorrect. Based on what we've read on the questions and Gideon's conclusion, his conclusion is totally, totally wrong. The questions he has, listen, we are horrible at interpreting the events that happened to us. Do you know what I'm talking about? We don't always have the right perspective. And we're even worse at predicting the future. Thank you, news sources, all right? We're even worse at that. Uh, this explanatory style that Gideon has, it's actually wrapped up into sin, and we're going to see that in a minute. This is what sin does to you. It gives you a wrong perspective of who God is and who you are. It will mess you up. Listen, sin is, we've said it before, sin is out to get you. It's a predator. And it will mess you up in your thinking. It warps your perspective on God and yourself. And so many people in our culture especially are blaming God. They're quick to claim to be victims rather than looking at their own lives when they're really violators of God's word, not necessarily victims. Gideon asks this question, God, where are you? God, where are you? Where are your miracles what have you done for me lately, God? I read about it in the Bible, but I'm not experiencing that. Has God really left his people? No. The people have left God. Let's just get this clear in your life. Don't blame God for something you've done. If you've walked away from him, the word is repentance, turn around and come back. That's what our little symbol here at Gateway is all about, a place of repentance. And, and, and again, they're experiencing consequence. They're walking in sin and rather than walking with God. And this is what happens. Imagine the irony again, Gideon asking, where are all his wonders? Who's standing before him? An angel. <laughs> it seems ridiculous. But verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? God's answer to Gideon so the where are the miracles? He says, I'm about to do them, Gideon, but I'm going to do them through you. And you're part of the solution. You may be there yourself asking yourself, where are you, God? God says, I'm working. I'm working in you, and I want to use you, and I want to work through you. So just as a side note, uh, who is this angel? Because it's kind of confusion, confusing if you read it. 
It's an angel. He talks uh, about the Lord. And then it's kind of a mystery when you look, is he an angel or is he the Lord? The Old Testament will oftentimes have what we call a Christophany uh, or a theophany. Christophany is an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. And so many theologians would say this is a Christophany. It's an appearance of Jesus himself as messenger of God, angel, and God himself. Verse 15, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in the family. I'm too small. I'm a coward. I'm threshing wheat in a hole. That's basically what he's saying. In verse 16, the Lord answered, I will be with you. Say it with me. I will be with you. Somebody say, God is with me. God is with me. You need to declare that. And he says, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. In one answer, God is answering everything that you need. I will be with you. My presence will be with you. It's amazing how one promise, one promise from God's word can change your life. God is saying to Gideon, you will take out this massive army as if they were just one person. And look at verse 17. Gideon replied, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that is really you talking to me. Yes, it does sound crazy, doesn't it? But how I've found myself there. I know you told me, Lord. I just need to be reminded. I mean, he's going to go into battle with a lot of people, a lot of lives, a lot of families, a lot of husbands. Please do not go away until you come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. I'm amazed at that statement. You know how patient God is with you? You know how long it takes for a sacrifice to be made? You got to go out, get the animal, kill it, all those other things, dress it out, get it back, bring it back. So Gideon prepares it. It takes a long time. He puts it on the table. The angel touches the food with his staff, and the flames come up out of the rock and consume the food. And before we move on the text again, I want to make sure that you see these couple, a couple of principles. God sees who he wants you to be. God sees who he wants you to be. When God comes into your life, he never starts with, again, where you are. He starts with who he wants you to be in Christ. So he looks and he says to you, mighty Warrior, we need some ladies who are mighty warrior. We need some men who are mighty warrior. I've been praying, God, just send me 10 men, 10 mighty warriors to stand for you, God, to, to live for you, God, to follow after you, God, to be the God of their home, to be the leader of their home, and let the God of the Bible lead them, Lord. And a mighty warrior, I have a little bit of hesitancy. This is what Gideon's saying. A little bit of hesitancy here. I don't feel qualified, God. You don't understand. How many people in the Bible have ever felt qualified for the job that God gave them? None. Zero. So if you feel unqualified, it's probably because he's speaking to you. Go back there. Listen, when you were dead in your sins, not just mostly dead, like Princess Bride, you were dead. You were dead meat. You were dead meat in the fridge. All bled out, no life in you. God speak to you, speaks to you when you were dead, and he calls you alive based on the resurrection, the crucifixion of Jesus, the res resurrection of Christ, the power of Christ in your life, and calls out to you to live alive based on the resurrection. When the question comes to you, and when the answer comes back to you, mighty warrior, will you believe him when he says, mighty warrior? Satan, listen, is the one who tries to define you by who you are and what you've done. That you're a failure, that you're a coward, that, that you're a reject. Then he tries to find some facts to back it all up. I don't know, am I speaking truth? Have you felt it? He tries to do all this. This is why he's called the accuser. He's a liar. He accuses you. And God says to you, you are my beloved. You are righteous. You are an overcomer. You are a mighty warrior. You say, but I'm not the guy. I'm not the gal. God says, you will be. Some of you get confused on which voice is speaking to you. You know there's a voice speaking. Listen, Satan and the Holy Spirit are speaking, but both about your sin. Satan will, again, start with what you've done, beat you up for it. That's called condemnation. The Holy Spirit speaks, and he speaks a declaration over you, and he makes you into Christ, more like Christ, and he grows you up into that, and he will convict you of sin. That's what the Holy Spirit does, so that you will return in repentance and say, godly sorrow, Lord, I know I've offended you, and I want relationship back with you. That's called confession. 
So God's presence is greater than your fear. No matter what you're faced, God's presence is greater than your fear. Some people uh, say, well, what, what about, you know, my fear's still there. How do I have courage? Courage isn't the absence of fear. It's not the absence. You've seen all the slogans, all the posts. It's, when you say it's the absence of fear, that's just being naive. That's not being real, rooted in reality. It is, well, then do I ignore it? I, I can hear my daughter's voice. Do I ignore it? That's actually foolish. It's following God in spite of it. God's one-line answer to your fear and your insecurity is, I will be with you. I am the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am greater than the fear that you're facing. And there's some real things to be afraid of, Pastor Ron. You don't understand. I don't. I remember standing in the operating standing, laying in the operating room, all standing around me were my healthcare people, right? They all go through what they're going to do. I'm like, why are you telling me this? I'm really freaked out now. <laughs> and I had to go, just trust the Lord, Ron. My fear's still there. And they counted like 99, and I was gone. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't have anything to think about. Here's the question. What would your life look like if you knew that in every situation that God was with you? What would it look like in your work life, in your family life, in that marriage that's struggling with your kids who are falling away from God and rebelling? What would your life look like for that addiction that you're struggling with if you knew that God was with you? Again, God wants to deal, yes, with the problem in front of you, but he wants to do a work inside of you first. Look at verse 23. But the Lord said to him, peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord, and there called it the Lord's peace, the Lord is peace. To this day, it stands, where? In Oprah and Abizarites, that, some, uh, th that same night, sorry, the Lord said to him, take your second bull from your father's herd, the one in seven years, and tear it down. Your father's altar to, to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole. I told you about Baal and Asherah. These were the gods of the age. This would be like destroying mobile devices in California. I mean, you would have a riot on your hand if you replaced every mobile device with God's word. It would be crazy. But it's a big task, lots of negative impact, but look at verse 26. Then built the proper altar to the Lord your God on top of this height, using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull and a burnt offering. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him. Because he was afraid, he's, again, not a great mighty warrior yet, of his family and townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. Again, Gideon's not like William Wallace, right, with the face paint and everything, right? right? But, but don't criticize him too much because he's being obedient just because it was at night. But God prefers your obedience over bravado every time, by the way. And you'll see that throughout, but throughout Judges. Verse 28. The morning when the people of the town got up, there was a Baal's altar demolished with the Asherah pole. Beside it cut down, the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. And things were great. Is that what happens in the text? Actually not. So everybody's like, what's going on here? Who did this? And they're all blaming Gideon. All blaming Gideon. Again, uh, I want you to recognize this. God is calling Gideon to get rid of something in his family life. There's still an altar to an idol. Two idols. And I want you to know this, uh, this is the basis of serving God is allowing him to take care of our idols. And we still have them today. Most of us don't have a little idol at home. The idol is usually us. What we want. Restoration, listen, around you begins within you. God has to do some restoring within you. He wants to deal with the idols that you're still holding on to. Listen, church, I know this to be true. We need to, to be this so that the community around us can see this is what God can do in our lives. It's easy for us to point the fingers, but as I was told, I think it was second grade, every time I point my finger, there's three pointing back at me. So that's like a trinity right there. What's God do you need to take care of in my heart? I believe that God wants to use many of you in a mighty way. I believe God wants to call you mighty warrior. He's calling on you. You've sensed that call, but you're still hanging on to the old life. You're still being duped by thinking you can totally go all in and still hang on to everything else. You can't. You gotta burn your ships. You gotta burn those halters. And you gotta say no more to that way of life and say, I'm all in on Jesus. Look at verse 31 because they, they wanna blame Gideon, but... Then Joash, his father-in-law, says, uh, replies to the hostile crowd around him, are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save Baal? Where, whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. Amen? 
So Joash saying, let's get this in the right perspective. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jerob Baal. The, soul, the old southern preachers call it Baal Tail Whooper. That's his name, right? That day saying that let Baal contend with him. Let Baal deal with it. After all this, the Midianites launch a massive assault on Israel, and God tells them to mount a resistance. And then Gideon says, verse 36, he said to God, if you will save Israel, he's not there yet, by my hand as you promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the fleshing, threshing floor. If there's dew only on the fleece and all the, dry, the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And that is what happened right there at the moment. So this is great. This is the fleece test. Have you ever tried the fleece test? So, so many, this is like probably the most abused, misused verses right here. Gideon rose early in the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Awesome. But God, that's kind of basic physics. I don't know if he said that, but you know, that's what I'm thinking when I read it. Then Gideon said to God, don't, don't be angry with me. Why does he say that? He's going to ask again. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece, but this time make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew because that would be an amazing physical feat. Like, Lord, that would be a real miracle. And verse 40, that night God did so, only the fleece was dry and all the ground was covered with dew. Again, oftentimes the most misused verses for Christians in the Bible. I know I use this fleece test in trying to understand if I should marry Mary Shea. I did it with three-point shots. No, just kidding. I didn't do that. Um, but we do this, don't we? God, I just want to know. And, and what we need to understand is Gideon knows God's will. How do we know? How do we know he knows God's will? Again, what is he saying to him in verse 30? Now, he's asking God not to be angry with him. He knows God's will. What he's asking for is, God, are you present with me? Are you with me? How do I know that you're really here with me on my side? How do I know that you're really in control of all this? This is where we find the gospel in the pages of Judges. We have something much better that shows us that God is with us and in control. We can read Judges on the other end of the cross and see that every judge in their own way is pointing to a Savior that will come one day. Not a fallen Savior, but a perfect Savior. And his name is Jesus. Instead of looking to circumstances and testing God with the fleece, we can look to the cross and find your confidence. Look to the cross. What does that actually mean? That's kind of church language. The cross is the place where Jesus took all of your sin. When you lived an imperfect life, he lived a perfect life. He went to the cross for all of your sin so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be then clothed with his gift righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness you could not pay on your own. He paid for you so that you could have it and walk freely in Christ and be forgiven and righteous because of what Christ has done for you. Listen, God is for you even when you're his enemy, but God demonstrates his own love for in this, us in this. While we were still, what? Sinners, Christ died for us. You're on a path. God has you on a path. That path is leading back to him. But he gives you a will and a choice. Will you turn to him today? Jesus is so for you. You'll be so overwhelmed by his love. But you have FOMO. You're fearing that you're going to miss out on something great. Let me, that's a lie from the pit of hell. God wants greater things for you. He wants you to have a, an abundant life in Christ. This resurrection power gives you the confidence to look fear in the face and take courageous steps of obedience and by the way, if you wait around to God to give you everything that you need before you take steps of obedience, it's not going to happen. When you take a step of obedience, just look at Gideon. God meets him with courage. Some of you need to hear that. Find courage then in the presence and promises of God. You know this. I keep pushing you back towards the scriptures because that's where you're going to find life. That's where you're going to find joy. 1 John 4, 18 says, There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Fear has to do with punishment. We see things, and yes, there are things that are fearful, but you can feel vulnerable when you're fearful. I know this. That goes all the way back to Genesis in the garden. When Adam and Eve felt vulnerable in their sin, they tried to cover themselves up with things that they, that they were inadequate, and God gave them animal skins. A sacrifice had to be made for that covering up. The word is to be justified. We're trying constantly in our culture to justify ourselves, how strong we are, how smart we are, what kind of grades we get. 
if we get the raise, if we get that job, then we'll feel justified. Listen, I'm just telling you, that's a dead-end road. My friend Kent Adney says that you're not going to find any cheese at the end of that tube, right? This is what, there's nothing there for you. But I can tell you this, put your hope in Christ, your identity in Christ, and he will lead you down paths. And yes, sometimes it's successful, and it's awesome. Again, don't fear. Don't try to put your own stuff on to try to justify you with all those things. But look to the cross where Jesus justifies you just as if I'd never sinned. As you come to him in repentance and confession, he washes you white as snow. We celebrated baptisms last week. That's what that is all about, showing you an inward work, an outward expression of an inward working. In Christ, listen, some of you need to hear this. He, can, he will never love you more than he loves you now. He loves you completely. He wants you. He's after you. He doesn't want your stuff. He doesn't want your finance. He doesn't need that. He wants your heart, but he's not going to break in and violate your will. You must choose him. Listen, you choose God and his path and there's blessing. The Bible talks about it all over the place. But if you choose to sin, eventually you will choose to suffer. I know, I've been down that path. Look at Psalm 56, 10. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust and I am not afraid. Who, what can man do to me? What can man actually do to me if God's for me, he's saying? What? Nothing. They could say things. They could threaten things. But God has your life in his hands. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against me will prosper. Romans 8, 31. God is for us, so who can be against us? If you're in debilitating fear, you're stuck in a hole. Your perspective is all backwards and upside down. You are terrified. Return to God's love. Return to the cross. Return to the gospel. Believer, go back to the gospel, the good news of Jesus. God is with you. So get out of your hole, mighty warrior, and fill up your mission with his mission and be a conduit of power and grace. Not your power and grace, his power and grace. Real courage comes from God's presence and his promises and all that's given through the gospel, the good news, the euangelion. What we are called to be is ultimately conduits to those around us of the goodness and grace of God. Jesus sent out his disciples and he, that's us. He sent us, he says, this is the great commission, not the great suggestion. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Name of the, the Father, right? That's what we're supposed to be teaching them every, to obey everything I've commanded you. And Jesus says, I am with you always. There it is again, to the end of the age. So get after it. Go, go, mighty warrior. I am with you, God would say. I'm calling you to be my instrument. I'm calling you to obedience today. You may have doubts. That's okay. That's how faith works. Just keep walking in faith. Trust in Christ. Those doubts will melt away. The Bible calls you a saint. The Bible calls you an overcomer, an ambassador. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. We are therefore Christ's ambassador as though God were making his appeal through us, not around us. You are God's instrument. That means you are a mission from God while he supplies whatever provisions you need, whatever passion you need. Will you surrender him and allow him to use you? He says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's me this morning to you. If you're far from God, come back home. God is waiting for you. His arms are open wide, but you've got to turn around. You've got to repent and come back home. Verse 21, God made him who had no sin, Jesus, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God of God. This is God's word to us. How should we respond? What should be our response? Well, pastor, I'm kind of tired and lunch is coming. <laughs> I can tell you this. For some of you right now, eternity weighs in the balance. You may not be here a week from today. That's what this whole thing is made of, just aware of. I'm so frail. I live in an illusion of, of, of control. I'm not in control. God has my life in his hands, and he has yours. So what about it? If you've never come to Christ and really surrendered, I'm asking you today, will you surrender to Jesus? Maybe you've walked away like Israel. You're in that loop. I need to come back to Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If that's you today, and you know, I just need to turn back. Repent is the word. That's you. Raise your hand and say, that's me. I want prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Yes. I'm repenting. I'm turning back to God. Anyone else here in the room? I'm turning back. Yes. Yes. 
Anybody else? Father, you see these hands that have been raised, and Lord, more so those who have not necessarily raised their hands. I pray, God, that you would give them strength as they turn back to you. Father, may they feel that your presence is with them and that, Father, they are your child. Father, we confess as a body we need you. This church needs you. So, Lord, do in us what you would want to do. Make us more like you. Show us, Father, our idols, good things that have become God things, and we place them above you. And Lord, help us to be a people of the book, drawing others to your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name.